Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for Finding the Balance, how destination communities address resident needs amid the tourism explosion. I'm Shirley Wright, Chair of Forever Tybee, a 501c3 organization that works for ethical, open, transparent government and is dedicated to finding common grounds for solutions to ongoing problems. Our membership includes residents, business owners, and those who are interested in living on Tybee. Our goal is to ensure that there is a seat at the table for the permanent resident perspective for all the issues that impact Tybee because all issues impact our residents' daily and ongoing quality of life. The hot topic for consideration this already steamy July night is about tourism and the role of short-term rentals in specifically. We acknowledge that this is a most inconvenient month to meet because so many of our residents are on vacation or are in a training guest, but our city council is working this summer to make policy decisions before an August deadline. And to that end, we are working alongside them to educate ourselves with facts and with the experiences of others. In March, we asked renowned author Elizabeth Becker to give us a worldwide view of the explosion of tourism. And we heard about Paris, Venice, Rome, Barcelona, Cuba, Cambodia, and Africa, and how those communities have adapted to deal with tourism and also show maximum consideration for their residents. Tonight, we bring the topic closer to home as we look at two neighboring cities, Charleston and Savannah, and two citizens who have active lives there. Both cities are years ahead of Tybee in addressing the, tour the issue of tourism. And we welcome Elizabeth Kirkland Cahill and Nick Palumbo, who had front row seats as they went through hard decisions for their cities. We hope to learn from their successes as well as their regrets, if they have any. And we're also delighted to have Mary McLemore on board to be our questions moderator. I will introduce each of the three participants a little more just before they speak. So first, Elizabeth Cahill, author, civic volunteer, and preservationist. She began her career at the New York Shakespeare Festival, where she co-authored Shakespeare Alive and directed Shakespeare productions. She has held executive positions at the New York Public Library and been a regular writer for religious journals, including Commonweal and America. In 2010, she earned a master's degree in religion from the Yale Divinity School and also holds degrees in classics from Harvard and in English literature from Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. Betsy has been trustee of the Greenwich, Connecticut Public Library, the Association of American Rhodes Scholars, among other positions. She returned to Charleston, which is her hometown, in 2010, and in 2012 joined the board of the Preservation Society of Charleston. She has served as its chair since 2015 and was elected to the board of the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 2020. We are fortunate to have her with us to share her Charleston experiences, what neighborhoods and residents needed in the face of explosive tourism, the actions that have been taken, what worked and what didn't work, and her biggest lessons learned. Welcome, Betsy. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Shirley. Um, it's great to be with all of you tonight. Uh, Shirley told me uh, when she learned that I didn't have any slides for my presentation that I would be going first, which I think is akin to being sent to the front of the church when you're late. Um, but I am delighted to be here. I do want to be very clear that in my remarks tonight, I'm speaking as a private citizen and not as the board chair of the Preservation Society. My comments do not reflect official policy there. Um, and I have had sort of, as Shirley said, a front row seat in a lot of the tourism discussions in town. 
So just briefly by way of background, um, Charleston has been addressing questions of tourism management for over 40 years. And I would say with varying degrees of success. And that is the framework which the short-term rental discussion unfolded in when it arose. Our first tourism management plan was in 1978 when we had barely over 2.3 million tourists. There were subsequent updates in 94, 98, and most recently in 2014. And most part, as I read through these plans in preparation for the tourism committee meetings that I attended, it was remarkable how consistent the themes were and how excellent the recommendations were and how they all shared the similar fate of being put on a shelf and not fully implemented, if at all. Now, during those 40 years when Charleston was making attempts to manage tourism, we also had a visionary and effective mayor who was elected in 1976, Joe Riley, who was determined to grow the city. And uh, he embarked on a well-planned and determined effort to market the city as a tourist destination and to achieve top rankings in some of the travel publications that drive tourists. And in addition to the architectural beauty of the city that you may be familiar with, which is sort of our heritage, um, he drew the Spoleto International Arts Festival to Charleston, um, the Cooper River Bridge Run, which now attracts, before COVID, more than 40,000 people. Um, there were many other events and festivals. There was a development of a really robust food scene. Um, tourist attractions like the city market were rehabilitated. All of these added to the city's draw factor. And so right around the time that I moved back to my quiet, dignified, beautiful city, we were named number one city by Condé Nast Traveler, number one city in the US to visit. And we held that position for 10 years. And this past fall, to the delight of many, we slipped to number two. And the, one of the local alternative newspapers cheekily reported, the sun will rise over Charleston tomorrow for the first time in a decade as America's second best small city. But I will also say that reports of Charleston's demise as a top tourist destination were greatly exaggerated. And just about a week ago, we were once again named number one on travel and leisure's list of top US cities for the 10th year in a row. So with all of this activity and all of this vision and all of this planning and all of these rankings, um, it has felt particularly since 2010, like an avalanche of tourist activity. We had a very brief pause in 2020 in the early days of COVID in mid-March, right after things just shut down. We would, we would see residents wandering over the city sort of looking up and saying, we have our city back. Um, but that didn't last very long. And the latest numbers um, suggest that over 8 million tourists come to Charleston every year. Um, most of them at one point or another end up on the peninsula. And in the recent census, the southernmost portion of the peninsula, which is the oldest and most historic part of the city where tourists tend to want to be, um, has fallen to about 8,000. So we have 8 million people visiting and 8,000 people, 150 in the city of Charleston proper. You can already see that the ratio is out of whack by any measure of sort of tourism studies. And not surprisingly, um, hotels became the dominant and best land use choice for developers. So it seemed like every week another hotel application was coming forward. So as a result of the congestion and the hotel pressures and the sort of complaints from residents, Mayor Riley in his second to last year convened a committee to make recommendations for improvements in tourism management. It was a cross section of residents, nonprofit leaders, industry representatives, including restaurants, carriage companies, walking tours, some city staff, a couple of city council members, 
Um, and I served on this committee. And the committee's work was done in a very uh, orderly, well thought out fashion. We established subcommittees on say, one was quality of life, one was mobility and transportation, one was events and festivals. We identified the issues and we recommended strategies for improvement. Now, there were two notable omissions from the plan. Because Mayor Riley was a strong and some might say dug in supporter of cruise ships, um, we really had to dance around the issue of cruise ships. And we, our recommendations were all recommendations for studies or exploration and not action. Um, the second thing, which brings us to our topic is that there's no reference anywhere in this document to short-term rentals, because at that time in 2015, short-term rentals hadn't emerged as a problem. The plan as it stood passed unanimously at city council. And since then, in the seven and a half years since then, implementation has been fitful, it remains incomplete, but there are two or three important steps that were taken, which are relevant to the short-term rental discussion. One is that we established a Department of Tourism and Livability with a director who had been working on the livability side and was an ex-cop. And he's a real stand-up guy. His name is Dan Riccio, and he has said he will be happy to talk to you, Shirley, or any of you all, and just give you his thoughts on all this. And as part of that department, the city established a new position of tourism enforcement officer, which was not given, um, it, it cannot arrest, the tourism enforcement officers cannot make arrests, but they can cite people and bring them into livability court. And that has happened. We started with three, it was pegged to future growth and we now have seven. But there was no annual review of how the management plan was working. There were no measure of results. And as far as anyone can really see, the Convention and Visitors Bureau juggernaut rolls on seeking more accolades, more awards, more heads and beds. And this is occurring at the expense of the residents. And it's not just the residents of the historic district, it's all the people throughout Charleston who don't come downtown anymore because they can't find a place to park, they can't go into a restaurant, their quality of life and enjoying their city has been compromised. So pretty much as the ink was drying on the Tourism Management Advisory Committee report, short-term rentals started to become a problem. And there became, reports were coming out of the neighborhoods through our neighborhood associations. And unlike Tybee, Charleston has a pretty robust system of neighborhood associations, many of which are quite strong and others are still kind of developing. And as the Preservation Society and the neighborhoods grew increasingly concerned, um, the city finally acted and convened a short-term rental task force, which again had some preservation folks, it had a couple of industry folks, it had city staff and some concerned citizens. And in 2016, they began their work, they generated a very strong ordinance which went before city council in February of 2018. Now I wanna spend a minute on the meeting at which this ordinance was presented because one reason it got passed in my view is that citizens were coming out from all over the city to decry what they called the hotelification of their neighborhood. Not just the peninsula, but all over the city. They spoke of the effects on housing stock, on community fabric, on neighborhood character. And I wrote down a lot of the quotations and I still have the notebook four years on because they, people spoke about wanting to protect our neighborhoods from the dismantling of community. They wanted to prevent commercial intrusion into residential neighborhoods. They lamented that they were losing stability and the sense of community because we have no long-term neighbors. During the discussion by council, the council member for downtown spoke quite movingly. He pointed to two elementary school students in the audience and he said, these 
beautiful young children are my neighbors and they are long-term renters and they go to the grammar school in the neighborhood. And he talked about how the presence of a young family in his neighborhood so enhanced the neighborhood. And then he juxtaposed that with the story of a short-term rental across the street from where he lives, which is near our college, the College of Charleston. And um, the July 4th hoedown that brought several police cars and ended up in just a, a total mess. So it was a stark illustration of sort of what is at stake. So the ordinance that passed is very strong because it is clear and it is enforceable. And it is also flexible because it treats different areas of the city differently, which wouldn't be the problem for Tybee because it is such a more confined area. But it stipulates that in class one of the um, city, the short-term rental must be owner occupied. It has to be a primary residence. And, um, and then it has different criteria, but that base for the rest of the city. It has a very effective software program and dedicated enforcement personnel, and it prescribes criminal penalties for violation. Dan Riccio told me he thought we might be the only municipality in the country to take this approach. But if you violate the ordinance, you are fined every day is treated as a separate misdemeanor and that can add up pretty quickly. So last week I met with Dan for about an hour and a half to sort of find out how he thought everything was working um, now that we're sort of four years into the place. The software, <clears throat> the software that we use is called Granicus and it is very effective because it covers not just Airbnb and Verbo, but almost all of the platforms. And one of the linchpins of our ordinance is that you cannot advertise on any of these platforms without a permit. That is illegal and you will be fined for that. And the software can immediately identify anyone who's advertising without a permit. And according to Dan, probably 75 to 80% of the violations are caught at the advertising stage. And those who aren't go through the process that start with a cease and desist letter. And then there's a um, process server hired to serve the owner of court sermons wherever he or she is. And then the enforcement officers go to work locally to gather additional evidence. So with this sort of strong process, Dan says that his conviction rate is 100%. 385 have been adjudicated 385 convictions. There are 80 more currently in the court system. Uh, now, I, I know that you all are in a slightly different situation because you are, by definition, I would imagine, a, a large secondary home market. So you, if you ruled out short-term rentals for secondary homeowners, you there might be a way to shut it down. <laughs> um, but your situation, to me, is more akin to what um, the situation is at the Isle of Palms, which is a barrier island about 20 miles north of Charleston. And I am a very good friend of the former mayor there, who's a great guy and a local, and I imagine he would be happy to talk to you as well. Now, Isle of Palms um, wants short-term rentals. They don't seem to have any problem. They currently have, according to Air DNA, and I'm not sure how fully accurate that is, 1,342 short-term rentals on an island that is five and a half square miles. Apparently they're considering some changes to their ordinance and they do have some limits, but I don't get the sense that there's a crisis there. But there is a crisis in Charleston and I think you know, we have to remain vigilant because there are always people trying to get around the rules, change the policies and um, you know, what, what one person said at the city council meeting is that what short-term rentals do is they put residents and tourists in direct competition for housing. And that is not how things used to be. There used to be hotels, motels, even designated rental houses. But all of a sudden, everything is wide open and it... It is a, a competitive stance in which the economics 
disfavor the residents. So that is sort of how Charleston came to be where it is. Um, I would say, I think the short-term rental problem is working better than a lot of the other tourism enforcement issues we have. Um, and I was just at a meeting this afternoon where we're gonna continue to work on those. But I hope that at least that, that brief kind of summary of what Charleston has done will be helpful. Thank you, Betsy. Extremely helpful. I have a lot of follow up questions, but I'm not going to get to ask them. <laughs> so I will find out later. So now closer to home, we welcome Nick Palumbo, Alderman for District 4 in the city of Savannah. Nick was elected to the Savannah City Council in 2019. Before his election, he was president of the Ardsley Park and Chatham Crescent Neighborhood Association where he led the neighborhood in several pioneering efforts, including the creation of Savannah's Conservation District. Following this effort, he has been honored with the Lee and Emma Adler Award for Preservation Advocacy from the Historic Savannah Foundation. Savannah and Tybee's own Jane Fishman in writing for the Savannah Morning News described Nick as Savannah's, quote, cherubic, hope-filled and steady as he goes, Alderman. Nick is passionate about improving public safety, infrastructure, and promoting bikeability, walkability, and sustainability. So Nick, we welcome you from your, I assume, favorite hometown beach to share your hope-filled Savannah experiences, what your neighborhoods and residents needed in the face of explosive tourism, actions that were taken, what worked, what didn't work, and any lessons learned. Wow, well, Shirley, thank you so much for the great send up. I have to admit, uh, I've never followed a, a Rhodes Scholar before, so I have my work uh, cut out for me, but you know, this is a, this is a great group and, and just an honor to share with Forever Tybee. Uh, before I get to the presentation, I just wanted to take a moment of privilege to uh, express my profound loss that one of your board members, Molly Hannes, uh, had passed away in February. And Molly and, I, Molly and I had the opportunity to teach uh, together at the Savannah Early College. She was in the classroom right next door to me. And uh, she was uh, as strong as steel, but had a heart of gold. And I, I really wish uh, she could be here with us. And I would really love to show my stuff uh, to her, but I know she's looking at us right now and looking down. So uh, it's just an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, and let's get on with the show. I'm going to, here we go, uh, put, share my screen for everybody. So incoming, and then we have the slideshow. Now, just give me a thumbs up if you got, Shirley, how are we looking? Looks good to me. Okay, looking good. So finding ground, short-term vacation rentals, homestays, neighborhoods, what is this all about? Now, I have to admit, I am a mainlander, right? I'm here in the city of Savannah, and I'm here just to tell my story. Uh, I, I've deliberately uh, kind of kept out of trying to find out what exactly the specifics are going on Tybee, not because I'm, um, I'm not trying to be studious, but I wanted to give you an unbiased, unvarnished view of what we did in 2017, how it's working today, things that we would have done differently, uh, and the steps in the process that we took. So hopefully you have something that you can pick up and take with you uh, and have some fun along the way. And hey, big deal, take a time machine. Before I was in public life and as a, just an ordinary average Joe neighborhood president. So uh, as a neighborhood president, I represented 1,500 homes south of Victory Drive. Uh, and we were actively part uh, of this debate and the crafting of the nation's or one of the first uh, short-term vacation rental ordinances uh, in the country. And I'm happy to report that by and large, uh, everything is working out. It's really been a while since it, we've talked about this, which is good news, because uh, it's, hey, the city of Savannah is an outrage cannon. We just move on to the next thing. So, um, you know, but that's good news. So if you mentioned short-term vacation rentals three times at any community meeting, including in my neighborhood, people will come at you with torches and pitchforks. Oh my goodness. I don't think I've seen people seem so angry before in, in trying to determine what's good for the neighborhood. Do we allow 
Airbnbs? Do we allow homestays? What's the difference between an inn? What's the difference between uh, sharing one room in the house or the whole house? Uh, it was a hotly debated topic here in the neighborhood. Some folks uh, took it to court and they're, they're still riding that train out there. Best wishes to them. I, I don't want to ride it with them. Um, but because it's such a personal experience, I know that this can be an extraordinarily contentious topic. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today uh, about the big ideas, background on short-term vacation rentals, a little history, some home sharing vocabulary, and uh, how our ordinance was created, what's the process, how does it work, like how does a, the nuts and bolts of an ordinance actually work, and then how is it enforced and, and regulated? And I'm happy to report that it's, you know, building bridges is how it works together. Um, it's hard to imagine that just in 2007, three, you know, two guys in, in San Francisco can't pay rent uh, and go on to create uh, a $60 billion company in today's value. But, you know, they're not the only one that's out there. And what makes short-term vacation rentals so interesting is because of their ease of access, there's 125 different platforms that are out there. I mean, it's it's uh, mind-bending, just the number of different companies that you can go through, experience. But I will tell you, uh, the one personal point I'll interject is you do have an advantage that you have local partners and local companies to talk to to work these things out. And that was our advantage in 2017, uh, and that seems to, to persist there too. So let's take the time machine back to 2017. Wasn't that great? Wouldn't we all like to go back there for a while just to take a visit? <laughs> you know, I know that I would. Um, but I'll tell you that our perspective at the time, what's so fascinating about this and tuning in is in the Neighborhood Association, and I believe even in the city, it was always a property rights issue. It wasn't necessarily a tourism issue. Um, in the neighbors that we talked with here in the 1500 homes, and we sent out polls and we had neighborhood meetings, and there was a lot of shedding of tears and gnashing of teeth. Um, talking about the tourism industry really never came up. It was always about home determination. Uh, what's the neighborhood going to be? What's the neighborhood going to shape up as? And I think that that's really helpful in the conversations moving forward to think about the root issues that are there and what's the common ground that everybody wants. Uh, so let's take a look at them there. How do you actually do it? And it's an incredible balancing act. I have three dogs at home. I would never be able to put a milk bone on their nose, not one single one, and definitely not a Jenga of milk bones that are out there. But it's extraordinarily complicated, especially being the first ordinance in the country because you're having to walk before you can run and you're having to cover all of your bases. Uh, but we're gonna talk about why you have an advantage by doing it at the time that you're doing it now. But it is achievable, it is achievable, but it is extraordinarily complicated. Uh, property rights and, and land laws uh, go back to the old English ages of, of land use guidelines and, and where is land power derived from. I mean, even today, when you sign on the dotted line, you are, you are signing a document that says that you hold a title to that property. You don't necessarily own it. You own the title. Um, it is really complicated stuff that's out there back in the old days when the king would hand down titles to people. So uh, trying to navigate what somebody can do with their home can be a difficult prospect, but there is common ground that's out there. One thing that uh, neighborhoods have to recognize uh, is that uh, there are many residents that do benefit, long-term residents that do benefit from short-term vacation rentals. They do offer advantages. They allow people sometimes to age in place, uh, earn some extra income that are out there. So there's their, there are advantages there. This is from AARP about the advantages of aging in place, the ability to do that so that you can either uh, we have a lot of carriage houses in Savannah and laneway housing so that you can use an accessory dwelling unit uh, to have a homestay where that you're either renting out the main house or renting out, out the carriage house. Um, and what we found in the discussions were, I would say, four major points that everybody agreed upon. And that includes short-term vacation rental companies, uh, the little old lady on Duffy Street who has a, a homestay, neighborhood associations that are staunchly pro, neighborhood associations that were staunchly against. Uh, there were major principles that everybody had agreement on 
And what worked about our ordinance was building that bridge together to try to address those concerns. So biggest concerns out there, number one, were noise, uh, certainly number two, trash and, and trash policies. How do you deal with, with a lot of trash? Certainly parking, oh my goodness, parking, I think in every community meeting gets mentioned at least 50,000 times. And then finally, we had to address Nicholas Cage. So Nicholas Cage, uh, national treasure that's out there. Uh, but this is the logo, if you do a Google search for bad actors, uh, Nicholas Cage is the number one result out there. So how do you deal with bad actors that are out there, making sure that you have somebody that you can connect to when the issues arise? So striking the balance, and here were the major goals that I saw from the peanut gallery, right? Um, that residents, neighbors wanted more predictable outcomes for residents, businesses, and the city of Savannah. We're going to talk about that, that triangular diplomacy here in just a moment. Uh, everybody wanted a defined pathway for licensing and regulation. We hadn't quite figured that out yet. You could go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, I think, and then you pay for it. You got to appear in front of this governing body. I, I, it was really muddy. Uh, so we needed a more directed process on that. Uh, understanding how enforcement occurs and making sure that it's predictable and that it's fair and transparent, how to generate positive outcomes for everyone, and how to encourage and enable neighborhood determination. You know, because neighborhoods, when we got down to brass tacks and we were talking about it, they, they had different choices. Uh, and we're going to see how that plays out in just a moment when we take it to the map. And we are number one, right? We're not the, the, the best city out there. I happen to think that we are, but we were the first, I believe, to create a short-term vacation rental ordinance, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean we're the best. Uh, it was just the first. So you get the opportunity to really craft a, a, you know, the best one that's out there and improve upon the success of other communities that have built them out. And it really put us on the map. You know, We thought, I hope, of everything. We had to define what's the difference between an inn, a homestay, short-term vacation rental. We had to figure out good neighbor agreements. We had to figure out how uh, setting different minimums, the licensing requirements, uh, so much of it had to be drafted up. And all of lock, stock, and barrel, I believe it took six months uh, to be able to put this together. Uh, I called uh, some folks to take a trip down memory lane today, and they said that they have relatively fond memories of it. But I do know that it's it's working, uh, and, and this is a this is an accurate photo of the community meetings. That, that is definitely not an Adobe stock photograph. I, I can tell you uh, right now. Uh, but in reality, I can tell you that yes, most of the community meetings definitely did like look just like this. That was par for the course. I mean, this was a very personal affair. You're talking about what somebody can do with their home. You're talking about, you know, land use. You're talking about neighborhoods. You're talking, I mean, so many of these deeply personal issues. But the important thing is that we made it through uh, and we forged something that is, by and large, working uh, for the city of Savannah. So let's talk about that a little bit. And really, the way that I saw it is that we had three major parties. You had uh, a table of stakeholders, uh, and I was in the peanut gallery, and uh, really it was neighborhoods, businesses, and the city. And the city has its own position because, yes, uh, the city does represent uh, the residents' interests, but in thinking about the city, you have to have the city craft an ordinance and a code. They're going to be able to draft um, the boundaries and the guidelines of what's yet to come. You need to make sure that it's defensible in a court of law. You need to make sure that it's predictable and fair so that if ever it, it does appear in front of a judge, they've got some guidelines to work with. Uh, and you need something that's that's regular and predictable. I keep saying that over and over again, because those were really the big outcomes uh, that we were able to achieve. And we focused in three main areas. You've got your your Traditional, you know, your landmark historic district to the north, the Victorian district right in the middle, and then the mid-city district uh, each had their own different choices. Now, let's take it to the map and let's see how it ended up. Now, this is it here today. This is it here today. So um, these are the number of short-term vacation rentals that we have today. It's on a published on an open website, so you can see exactly where they're at. And the city of Savannah, the great secret is we went 
uh, neighborhood by neighborhood and block by block, trying to figure out how we're going to craft this together, working with our business partners to talk about what the caps are going to be, uh, giving them enough room to grow and breathe and, and giving enough predictability for residents to be able to work through this. And I know that the blue dots seem like, wow, that looks like a lot. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but I'll take it back to this slide because the advantage that we had in working this out and something I hope that you'll explore is that we were able to address this ward by ward. These were the fundamental building blocks that James Edward Oglethorpe even laid out in 1733, where you've got tithing lots, trust lots, and a square, so that we could go through, and that's how we were able to achieve that balancing act of 20% per ward, uh, was we went through these neighborhood planning units that existed for almost 300 years, we were able to determine them. So thank you, James Edward Oglethorpe. Uh, good job to you. So 1,200, that sounds like a ton, uh, but we were able to set that in place where it makes up just 2% of uh, abodes and, and dwelling units citywide today. Now let's talk about where the rubber meets the road and of course, all of the detailed work that is yet to come. When you're writing any code, you have to get all of the details absolutely right. And I'll prepare you because it is a wall of text. I tried, I really tried to make this interesting and engaging to read through a code and an ordinance, but some things just can't even be achieved by a lowly fourth district alderman. So I'm gonna do my best because the government is a ship that floats on a sea of paperwork. Uh, and you have a right to know what, hey, what is a code for short-term vacation rentals actually look like? So here's some of the lexicon too in the vocabulary. We had to define this uh, because you may not be familiar with what's the difference between an inn or a bed and breakfast. Well, we defined it, short-term vacation rental, STVR. Uh, a homestay is where an owner occupied single dwelling unit, somebody that lives in the home or maybe they live in the carriage house or they live in the main house uh, there. A bed and breakfast would be two to five rooms. An inn would be six to 15 rooms. Uh, and then here are some of the terms that you may be familiar with. These are the platforms, uh, Airbnb, VRBO. There's a, 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 over a hundred of them out there. And then I, I told you a little bit about the wards and the ward planning unit and how that really came in handy. So if you do a Google search of short-term vacation rental Savannah, you'll be able to see every single bit and piece of the process that it took uh, six months of, of team building, uh, community meetings, uh, to be able to work this out. And yeah, they got heated. Yeah, I mean, of course they do. You know, we're talking, you're talking about the future of your city, uh, but you can get through it and you can forge a strong partnership together for something that largely works for everyone. So we set a 20% per ward cap in the downtown historic district in the Victorian district. And one of the neighborhoods chose that they wanted to allow homestays uh, in the Thomas Square neighborhood so that they're owner occupied. So uh, a little bit of the neighborhood determination. If you, you know, we have a waiting list for capped wards. Uh, and yes, some of the short-term vacation rentals do roll off so that you can, you can apply. Um, we created a, a provision for those that were grandfathered in. Um, and we took a look at different neighborhoods too. And to identify the, the level of occupancy that we need to have, changes in rental agreements, including uh, an exemplar rental agreement or what many folks call a good neighbor agreement. Um, it has to be posted on the short-term vacation rental property. Uh, and there's even a sample agreement that you are more than welcome to steal, beg, borrow, and steal. Um, and, and here it is today, you know, that this is an agreement that you're going to be uh, a good neighbor. You're not going to exceed the listed occupancy. Uh, you're not going to exceed the maximum parking. Um, really, well, there's a lot about parking. I, I told you, there's always a lot about parking in there. But household trash is addressed there, keeping Savannah beautiful. And it's a primer for visitors that come and enjoy our city, uh, that they know the rules of the road. Uh, new applications, we have a process for that, uh, that they have to go through. Uh, provisions for condominiums. Uh, and so much more. If you Google search short-term vacation rentals in Savannah, you'll be able to see the entire roadmap and please uh, steal all, all the information that's there. Now, some frequently asked questions as, as we wrap this up, what about complaints? Well, today it's addressed by code compliance and we have a 311 call center uh, where it's investigated. You know, we watch for uh, in, uh, unlicensed short-term vacation rentals when they pop up and we help handle complaints. 
for noise, for trash, for parking that's out there. But I'll uh, put a little asterisk in this just for now because I'm going to show you what might be in the future uh, to talk about short-term vacation rentals and making this an easier pathway to walk. How is it taxed? Well, we got a policy for that. You know, you you pay state and local taxes, um, and these do add as a benefit uh, to cities. A sixteen uh, a six percent hotel motel tax is, is levied uh, at the city of Savannah. Uh, I believe in Tybee it's seven percent, uh, so that you get tourism product development, which are infrastructure dollars that are dedicated to infrastructure. There's other things that are out there as well, but it's all to make this open and predictable. Okay, uh, and then how to apply, and you can check that out as well. So in 2022, I would say by and large, with the exception of, of a handful of complaints that are out there, and hey, everybody's got their bad actors that are going to push the envelope, but you address the bad actors, right? Uh, the balancing act is still working out there. Um, but let's talk about what's next and what role technology will play, because it started as a technology platform, uh, and enforcement might take the form of technology as well. The market's always evol evolving, and we're just going to touch a moment on home rule as I round third plate uh, to get to home base here. Enforcement in the future may be very, very different than it is today. It's handled by a human being, you know, um, but there are companies that have emerged, including Avenue, and there's other, other different platforms that are out there that scour uh and, and align themselves with a city's uh overlay map for short-term vacation rentals to determine how to how to regulate them how to collect taxes from them uh how to deal with complaints uh this software uh includes a 24-hour call center so that you can call about complaints that are not emergency related if you have a trash complaint if you have a parking complaint uh and they address that immediately as well so a lot of the options as well, because you're dealing with fees and enforcement, they're cost neutral to cities. So that's very attractive for city councils to be able to manage it. Um, and, and so technology on the enforcement side is definitely catching up. And I'll leave you with just these last two slides concerning about your legal abilities out there, uh, specifically about home rule. So Georgia is a home rule state and our constitution grants counties and cities local self-government for, this is important, clearly reasonable ordinances, re resolutions or regulations for which no provision has been made by general law and is not inconsistent with the Constitution of Georgia. The important thing is reasonable, you know, that's out there, something that's defensible, something that you can, uh, that, that can be applied in the court of law, uh, that you can work together on. And uh, it's important because timing is everything. One thing that does concern me is that just about every year, the Georgia legislature, a couple of uh, legislators get a big idea that they're going to deregulate short-term vacation rentals statewide. They say that uh, the locals can be in control until they're out of control. Uh, so it's very important uh, that Georgia cities still have the ability to forge their own pathway. Some cities set caps, some cities ban them outright, some open them with wide arms. Uh, it's up to each individual municipality uh, and their people to choose. Uh, and that's an important part of self-determination. But I will tell you that uh, in the famous words of Elvis Presley, it's now or never, I don't know. Uh, I think it would be very important for any city across Georgia to, be, to do their ordinance now rather than later so that they have the chance to be grandfathered in for whatever may come to uh, fruition over at the Georgia legislature out of Atlanta. I know for me personally, I like being able to chart our own course, work with our partners here, and it's working. It's working. And uh, there's nothing worse than having somebody from Atlanta tell you what to do, isn't there? Right? Right? So um, you've still got time to be able to do that. So I'll close it with that. It's really about the power of partnerships and, and forging them together. And it's something from 2017. And I remember we left it with well, maybe we'll have to visit and retool this again, but by and large, it is continuing to work. So uh, I'm standing by here for any questions that you may have, and, and just a pleasure to be here with all of you. Nick, thank you so very much. Thank, we've learned so much from you um, tonight and, and from others in Savannah um, as we've gone through this process. We're very grateful.
So in advance of this program, as with all of our events, we ask our members and the general public to submit questions that could be asked to the speakers in a Q&A session after their presentations. And as you might imagine, there were many, many questions and much overlap in terms of what the topics were, which we have combined into about 25 questions and are going to ask as many of those as we can get answered before our night ends. And who better to ask those questions than a litigator? So I want to call on Mary McLemore to conduct this part of the program. Mary has worked at a private law firm as an in-house lawyer in private practice and as a partner. And in all those areas, she was a litigation lawyer, mainly defending companies from lawsuits. And as Nick said, everyone is aware of litigation at, on both sides of the aisle as we go through this process. After retirement to Tybee Island, Mary volunteered as a mediator and in the Savannah District Attorney's Office. And we are fortunate to have her bring her legal mind to our pursuit for truth and knowledge tonight as we find out more about what Betsy and Nick can teach us. Mary. And unlike, well, thank you, Shirley, by the way. Unlike in my career, when I got to formulate my own questions. I'm actually asking questions that people have submitted. Um, there, were, there was overlap. And so where there was overlap, I sort of tried to combine questions. So what I read might not be exactly what was submitted, but it's pretty darn close, or at least I tried to keep it very close. Um, so the first question is, tourism is a two-sided opportunity. Where is it easiest to see both the benefits and the downsides of increasing tourism and short-term rentals in, we'll start with Charleston. Where is it easiest to see the benefits and the downsides? Um, is that? That's the question, yes. Stating the question. Well, I would say almost everywhere. I mean, um, I will say that COVID was an interesting moment for us because um, it really underscored how, if not dependent, um, reliant our economy is on tourism revenues. I mean, the, the dollars from the accommodation tax, that is paid um, and, and other income from tourists funds our public safety. I mean, it, it is a linchpin of the budget. And so that gave a lot of us pause because we really were able to see how tourism was undergirding a lot of the city's operations. Now, in the long term, is this wise? Probably not. I think, you know, we the city would do well to continue its development as a diverse economy with the tech sector. We have a, a, a medical sector, we have universities, but um, that was a real wake up for us. But I, I think one of the challenges that Charleston faces as well as others is that sometimes it's hard to quantify the downsides. Um, you can quantify the impacts of the, the benefits because it's hotel occupancy rates, it's revenues, um, it's restaurant um, success. But the downsides are more difficult to quantify because they, they have to do with the quality of life as the residents experience it. And I think the challenge for Charleston in the coming years is to develop a, a livability bureau that is as effective as our convention and visitors bureau. We are a great place to visit. I mean, and, and I see that we have great attractions on so many ways, but Sometimes that makes us not such a great place to live. And I think prioritizing the voices of the residents, which is what Forever Tybee's mission is, is gonna be the right way to go. Because otherwise, with all the other challenges Charleston is facing that are non-tourism, um, the city's gonna become a shell of itself. 
Thank you. And Nick, do you have any other uh, observations other than that for Savannah? You know, well, I, I've only I've always subscribed to the mindset. I've only got friends and future friends. Uh, so to really talk about how we're going to work together with different industries, there are uh, a, a enormous uh, advantages to having high sales tax uh, revenue and that uh, visitors support our small local businesses. They seek out unique experiences that are out there. Uh, and we're going right now, we're going through a local option sales tax negotiation and, and those sales taxes offset our property taxes. Uh, but uh, what I've found is you build those bridges to the different industries and talk about the concerns where they are and as they happen. And they've always been more than willing to open up the door and, and build that bridge to work together. Um, you know, if you walk into a room with your fists up, sometimes everybody's ready to fight you. Uh, but I hope that building bridges is a great pathway to success. Great, great, thank you. All right, next question. In 2021, Tybee Island's tourism industry reported a record year in sales and customers. 2022 seems to be on the same track. Is this similar to what Charleston has experienced? And if so, how does your city address the growing numbers of tourists? Yes, um, the growth has been um, really dramatic. Um, just in the last 10 to 15 years. And, um, you know, I think in a way, the whole tourism conversation, as our city council member has said in the past, is really about how you move people around a city. And if you can move them around in, in, in sort of efficient and resonant friendly ways, then maybe that works well for everyone. Um, but there does not seem to have been as many bridges built um, in some corners of the tourism industry and some neighborhoods as as we would like. Um, and there's more, I would say, um, antagonism. And, it, and I think a lot of the tourism conversation anywhere has to do with geography. We have a very different geography from Savannah, for example, and we're a peninsula and everything funnels into that peninsula. And then it goes down to the tip of that peninsula and there's just nowhere for people to go. So, um, it's just a real opportunity to think about how the geography can be a, a, an opportunity and not just a, a hindrance to a, a livable city. Nick, how about Savannah? What are yeah, your if you're taking a look at it like a ship, you know that it's it's balancing out. You know that um, right now the demand right now is is housing. It's housing, 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 housing. Where is it going to go? Where are people going to live? Uh, you have uh, 8,100 manufacturing jobs that are coming online just outside of the county. You know, line for electric vehicles, which is great. Uh, Gulfstream's got 2,000 openings right now, and they're about to launch some new lines out there too. Um, and I think by and large, I haven't seen the numbers, but you've, you've seen uh, that the physical number of visitors uh, is, is balancing off, right? It's balancing off that it's there. Um, not as many hotels are being built. And really the sentiment in real estate demand has shifted uh, largely to housing. And our, our next fight uh, upon us in the city of Savannah is really we know we're going to have to grow by at least a quarter. Uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, uh, and where are those people going to live? And that's going to be very challenging because we, we can't go further east. <laughs> sort of a natural barrier there. That's right, <laughs> a little bit. Okay, um, next question. Have you protected the residential areas of your city from the impacts of tourism and the full-time residents who call it home? And if so, how? <coughs> Um, I think in some ways we've protected them, but um, I think the, the, the risk that 
the historic district is facing is just sort of increasingly being treated as a commercial commodity and not a place where people live. And there are other factors that are at play there, including the number of the, the, the prices of real estate, the number of people who only live in the historic district part of the year, as opposed to when I was growing up here, it was all families who were here. It wasn't people who come in for the weekends or for three months a year. Um, so I, I think in some ways we've protected. Um, we, we do have uh, you know, a long track record of tourism management, but um, I think as the city grows in population and the and expands, um, the pressures are still being felt in that downtown area. Um, and people are feeling more beset and besieged. And, you know, there are the anecdotes. Of a young man who lives a couple of blocks from me told me a couple of weeks ago that he and his wife were sitting upstairs after they'd put their child to bed and having a glass of wine. He suddenly heard footsteps on his stairway inside. He went down and there were two tourists who'd come and open the door, which I guess was unlocked, and said, well, it said on the plaque outside that your interior woodwork on the second floor was really amazing. So we just wanted to come in and see it. Huh. Um, so huh. anecdotes like that are, are pretty easy to come by, although they don't necessarily tell the whole picture. But um, anyway, you know, always an opportunity to do more. And again, I think a, a resonant focus would and bringing more residents around the table would go a long way. Thank you. Nick, how about for Savannah? You know, I think one thing we could have done better and one thing we'll have to evaluate in the future is really thinking about, you know, we had it confined to largely three neighborhoods. We were working on this in 2017 and there is an equity issue there. There is an equity issue that's been brought up by members of council uh, that talking about other neighborhoods that should have access to that as an income generator, uh, as a boost of property values. And they bring up a very valid point and a question. Uh, one thing that we hadn't quite figured out in 2017, and maybe the technology is there now, is how to better account for what's a homestay versus what's an STVR. Uh, and that can be very difficult because it's somebody's private property. you know. Uh, but now there's more guidelines in place. Uh, the state of Georgia, passed a provision, I believe, last year that more readily defines short-term vacation rentals, what they are, uh, where they can go, how they're regulated, and by the way, to collect taxes from them, uh, <laughs> which is what they like, like to do. Um, but that's that's really an opportunity, you know, it's an opportunity for improvement. And eventually, I know our city is going to have to open up the debate again, but I'll take it back to the second slide, slide with the torches and pitchforks. You know, I, I'm not sure we're wanting to exactly go back there right now. <laughs> okay. Um, what education effort or strategy has worked to make tourists more respectful of the rules and the unique needs of your city? <laughs> if any. Uh, I would go with the if any, Mary, for 200 <laughs> Um, you know, that is a real issue is just sort of tourist comportment because the, the draw in Charleston is the residential neighborhood. So it's not a, a lot of museums or galleries, you know, in one place or a lot of tourist attractions. One of the main tourist attractions is the places where people live. And I, I think the probably the most effective thing that we've done, which doesn't have anything to do with tourism, is we have a pretty good system of parking decals and enforcement so that the streets are not, and this was something that was dealt with in that 2015 update, is making sure that there was, that neighborhoods had the parking limitations that they wanted. And not all neighborhoods are the same. Some are 24 hours, you cannot park here if you don't live here. Some are, you can park here for two hours if you don't live here and then you can park here overnight. Um, 
but as far as um, you know, the then planning director of, of the city of Charleston during the tourism management update said that he and Mayor Riley were absolutely not going to let Charleston become a museum or a playground for tourists. And it's definitely not a museum, but it's it's status as a living, working city where people live and raise their children, particularly in the, the older parts, the historic parts, um, it's pressured. So I think that is um, an oppor there's an opportunity if we can come back and I love Nick's phrase, outrage cannon, because it really fires when tourism is brought up. But I think if we could get some reasonable people in the room around the table, we could make some more headway on that. Nick, I know you talked about that your short-term vacation rental policy has sort of the good neighbor agreement as part of it. Is there anything else that Savannah has done to educate tourists to be more respectful? Yeah, you know, and I think it, this is an unorthodox answer, but I, I think it comes down to to marketing as well. You know, how what marketing takes place, um, trying to determine, you know, that by and large, I mean, folks come down to have a good time, but uh, we're not seeing as much of, of the booze cruise kind of stuff uh, that you've had. That's really changed a lot. We had a very different St. Patrick's Day parade this year uh, that was more family friendly. And we could always do more for education and outreach. Uh, specifically, what we're trying to do right now is help our streets be safer. We've got a long way to go on wayfinding uh, and <laughs> traffic safety, uh, because if you're unfamiliar with the city of Savannah and exactly how the squares are going to work and that they're one way and some streets are one way, uh, that leads to a lot of issues as well. We're working that on that with the traffic engineering front. Okay, thank you. Um, so part of this question, I think you've already answered, but I'll read the whole thing. And does Savannah or Charleston work with residents or resident groups to ensure their voices are heard alongside the business leaders and tourism marketers? If so, how? And what are the most frequent concerns raised by residents or resident groups? Um. I would say we um, we do that through our neighborhood associations, um, and we also have a tourism commission that operates with a mix of industry representatives, and but they're fairly limited in the in their in their purview. Um, so I, I think the neighborhood associations. I know under the previous mayor, they were you know, regularly had meetings with the mayor. I don't know that that is um, currently the situation, um, but I think we have a structure in place and it it often with, as, as many things do, it boils down to who's involved and who's leading the effort as to how effective it's gonna be. It really boils down to the people you have running that particular neighborhood association for that particular term. Nick, how about in Savannah? Yeah, we've had, we've really gone heavy into neighborhood associations, neighborhood planning units uh, for a number of decades now. Some of them are very well formed, including our, our downtown neighborhood association, Victoria Neighborhood Association, and, and uh, Thomas Square, all which participated in the crafting of the ordinance. And really, I don't think it would have been possible to do it without them, because they can get, uh, they can take uh, a collective community voice and bring it into one voice. Uh, and to work with, because you need to build those bridges, have those partnerships to be able to make that work. Um, one advantage that we also had is having local business partners uh, to be able to have this conversation with. It's, it's very frustrating because it does happen. There's some nationwide companies that are out there, which is challenging, uh, but you've got local businesses and groups. And, and I think in Tybee's pathway to craft this ordinance, that you've got that as an advantage, uh, really, to work with a good partner, reach out to Michael Owens, reach out to the folks that are running the vacation rental companies that are here to build those bridges because they're right here in town. 
so that you can have those face-to-face -face conversations, even when it's a difficult conversation, an extraordinarily difficult topic. Um, and everybody's just around the corner ready to get the torches and pitchforks next time. Uh, but we do meet once a month uh, in a, regularly for our neighborhood associations. We have 127 neighborhoods in the city. Not all of them have a neighborhood association, but it does help. Okay. So next, the next sort of general topic is enforcement. Um, and what has been your most successful enforcement tool to deal with tourism? And what has been the biggest challenge your city has faced with enforcement? Um, I think the software is the key to our enforcement abilities. Um, and Dan, and the fact that you must be, it can be easily identified whether you're a 4% taxpayer, meaning it's your primary residence. And Dan Riccio told me a story of a couple that were married, but they had separate 4% residences and they would rent one for short-term rentals and live in the other, and then they would switch back and forth. So they were basically gaming the system. And I would say that's the biggest threat to enforcement, but um, Dan kept at it and took them to court. And not only did they have to pay about $18,000 in fines, the county then went after them for claiming two primary residences. So I think they, they were, they rued the day that they ever got into the short-term rental business. So I, I think that that is one challenge. The other challenge is just the challenge that our whole country is facing, which is staffing. It is hard to find people to work in city government, just like it's hard to find people to work anywhere. Um, so I feel like the enforcement staff, there's always sort of, they're always maybe one short of where they need to be or two short of where they need to be. Um, but I think that the good news is that the word has gotten out that Charleston means business. And if you try to get away with something and get caught, it's going to be costly. So I think that that is a, you know, that is helpful. Nick, how about Savannah? Yeah, if you hit folks in the pocketbook, they can get it back in line pretty fast. Um, there's always going to be issues out there, you know, that pop up for, for noise, trash, you know, parking, uh, and bad actors like Nicolas Cage, you know, <laughs> that pop up from time to time. The most challenging ones are, uh, We've got some operators that are out there that uh, one in particular I'm thinking of that I think he just likes being in court. You know, that's he's got a he's got an eye on that hill and and he's taken it to Superior Court a number of times. And that's a neighborhood dispute that's raged for at least five years, maybe 10. Uh, uh, and then you've got other challenges. We had uh, a rental operator that had 30 or 40 homes and, and he was uh, he was doing that, but he kept them in a poor condition. Uh, he was treating tenants poorly. Like those can be very complicated issues as they head to court. But by and large, code enforcement, you know, when they notice a violation or there's an uh, unlicensed listing, they'll send out the notice that evening uh, to get it back in line. Okay. Does your city have parking? I mean, we've talked about this a little bit. Do you have parking requirements that are applicable to the short-term rentals? I mean, do you have specific parking requirements for the short-term short rental properties? I was trying to find that in the ordinance because I remember a lot of discussion about it. And I believe there are parking requirements attached to short-term rentals, but also the cap on the number of people who can stay in a short-term rental helps with that because you can only have four people. So my, I, if I can find it while on this meeting, I, I will do so. But I believe at the very least, the any short-term renters would have to comply with the parking requirements of, of that neighborhood. But the way the ordinance is structured, it's almost impossible to have a, a legal short-term rental in the historic district residentially. We have two categories, and I should have said this at the beginning, but we have residential short-term rentals, which are people renting out a room, but we also have commercial short-term rentals, which are, which 
allow investors to, and, it, and it's limited to really one area of the city, one neighborhood in the city, and properties can be bought for the purpose of creating short-term rentals. Um, and then, did I understand you that you have a cap, regardless of how large the property is, of four people in the short-term rental? Yeah. Okay. Nick, how about Savannah? Yeah, we've got it as a part of the exemplar agreement, you know, they park in a designated spot, make sure to respect and pay the meters. Uh, our parking enforcement officers are stellar. I'm sure that everybody is here <laughs> has, has gotten a parking ticket from uh, Savannah's finest out there. Uh, and I'm going to say something pretty uh, shocking. That's uh, the most shocking thing that I could say. I, I think Savannah has honestly too much parking. I know, I know parking is a very sensitive subject, but there's my, one of my favorite books is out there. It's by Donald Shoup, The, the High Cost of Free Parking. Uh, and parking is so extraordinarily expensive. And for our city, where we've really been focused in the future is, we know that we can just never build enough parking. Uh, I mean, there's uh, the more that you build, the more induced demand you get for car traffic. And that we really have to focus on transportation and transit and how people move. That's been very important. And we have a new Chatham area transit director that's online, Faye DeMassimo, who's outstanding uh, and really understands how people move through the community is important. Uh, their methods of transportation, uh, how they're getting to their destination and figuring out that user experience is gonna be very important for our city's future. Do you have residential areas that require the owner to live full time in the short term rental? And if so, how has that worked and how do you enforce that? In, in the category of residential short term rentals in Charleston, um, you can have up to four adults on a property that you own and occupy as your full time residence, period. And the way you enforce it is that those homes are taxed at the 4% rate. Homes that are secondary residents as is are tax, taxed at a 6% rate. So the minute an advertisement goes up, it's very easy to use the software to check and make sure that this is a primary residence. Um, so th the idea is that if you really wanna run out of room in your house and you meet the other criteria and you live in a residential neighborhood, okay. If you want to buy a whole house for the purpose of renting it out, you can only do that in one section of the city. It's called the Cannonborough Elliott Borough neighborhood. And you said four, four adults in a house. What about children? I do not think the ordinance addresses children. Okay. So I would assume, you know, if you wanted to bring in a dozen children, you would not be a foul of the law, but I don't know why you would want to do that if you were on vacation. <laughs> Excuse me, Nick, what about Savannah? Yeah, well, we do have an owner-occupied district, uh, the Thomas Square Historic Streetcar District, and what's interesting is in 2017, uh, my memory is getting fuzzy, but I believe they advocated to opt in to the process. That is something that they wanted for their neighborhood. Uh, to be proactive in thinking about that. And that requires the homeowner to be on site uh, that's there. There are some occupancy limits. Oh, you're really gonna test me here, uh, but I believe it's, it's uh, shall not exceed four adults per dwelling units with no more than two bedrooms. Uh, but that was a neighborhood, their own determination had, had chosen that, but they wanted that in their portfolio. Okay. Um, in either Savannah or Charleston, do the permits for short-term rentals, existing or new, transfer upon sale or other ownership transfer of the property, or does each new owner have to reapply? Nick, why don't you take that first, because I'm going to check our ordinance. <laughs> yeah, that, that one, you might have stumped me on that one. I'm not quite sure if it transfers. I do know, I do know that some have expired, and I do know that there's a waiting list, you know, for wards that have met the cap uh, that are out there. But I'm I'm not positive on a transfer yet. Okay. What our ordinance says is that upon a change of ownership, 
in ownership of a property, the new property owner has to certify that he or she is compliant with the regulations. So it sounds like as long as there's compliance, you can renew it, but you have to renew it annually. So, and we don't have a cap. So that's why I think that is there as it is. You just, you have to re-up every year anyway. Can, can, and you may know this, you may not. Can you describe the process that your city used to craft its short-term rental policies? Who wrote those policies and did, did you hire a professional city planner? I can, although I was not on the short-term rental um, task force, I'm familiar somewhat with how it worked and, and read some of the documents. Um, it was a combination of city staff and the members of the task force who actually generated the draft. Um, city staff really led the effort and they probably generated the draft for comment by the members of the task force. And it was sort of interesting what happened because the ordinance was very strong and it went to the planning commission before going to city council, which is the process. And the planning commission watered it down. And so there was a lot of discussion and frankly confusion at that city council meeting about well, which ordinance are we voting on? Um, because there are some discrepancies and ultimately um, they took a slightly graduated approach but they ended up going with the stronger ordinance. Um, but it was done by existing city staff. Okay. Nick, how about in Savannah? Yeah, we have the advantage from what I remember that they were able to approach the council with a fully baked cake and everybody could come in together. And uh, everybody got a little something, everybody lost a little something, um, but it, it took six months from the very beginning. Uh, and, and we didn't have any real reference material out there. We were building upon just our own personal experiences as one of the first ordinances out there. Um, you know, maybe oh. I, I've taken a look at some of the other ones out there and maybe it's a little, uh, it, it had to define what, how many occupants per, per dwelling unit, where does the parking go? What do the agreements look like? I mean, it was a painstaking process, but I know that the stakeholders and the community members, which inclu included uh, industries, neighborhood associations, advocates uh, as well, all had a hand in, in crafting it. Uh, and of course, there were a couple of public stakeholder meetings as well, uh, where the public was encouraged and, and encouraged to give their feedback. Of course, a lot of work went into going to each individual neighborhood association, presenting the options to them. Um, but it, I believe the entire process took six months and was finished in August of 2017. And surely I broke the only rule you gave me and I went over time. So we, we are out of time. We still have many questions left, but we're out of time. So. We do. Thank you, Mary, for being our moderator. And thank you so much, Nick and Betsy, for being expert guides here as we work our way through our own issues and emotional and complicated policy decisions. We hope that we have permission to write you if we have other questions. And, um, and I am going to take you up on getting with your uh, livability director because I do okay. want to know more about that. Okay. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. If you have questions, please send them to forevertoby at gmail.com. There may be things that, that you wished you could ask tonight, but we were plowing through this, this list of questions. And also, if you want to stay a part of this action as Tybee makes decisions about the future and about the quality of residential, go to www.forevertybee.org, join us, sign up for our Facebook page. And this, um, this wonderful program, thanks to our great speakers, has been recorded and you will be able to watch it again on our website and um, probably on YouTube. So we will share it, be able to share it with others soon. We hope that we will have another Zoom or in-person event soon and probably before the council hits that August 11 deadline. And we hope to see you then. In the meantime, thanks again to our participants and good night all. <laughs>